I'm going to go out on a limb here, even though I'm not a lawyer. I'm not even a, you know, a court employee. Never been to law school. Me, I think this is one of the biggest things, but I'm, hey, I'm not a lawyer. I've never pretended to be a lawyer. I am not, I'm, I'm not even a country lawyer. I just, this is just me. I'm not a lawyer. I don't pretend to be a lawyer. Well, here it is. The magical motion to dismiss that gets traffic tickets dismissed, according to Stevens. Now remember, I'm analyzing it for the layman and those who believe in its magic, not for the legal professional. So let's take a look at it. Well, of course it starts right off with a sovereign citizen or soft-set tactic, as you can see, alleged defendant. That's, a, that's an indication right off the bat. And it starts out like most, now comes whatever name, the alleged defendant by special appearance. Well, speaking of appearance, that's our second appearance of a soft sit tactic. Special appearance uh, is not relative to a criminal case. If there's any uh, appearance in a criminal case, it's by compulsion. It's a compulsory appearance. Think about it. When you get a ticket, you're asked to sign it. If you don't sign it, you're arrested and taken to appear before a magistrate. But by signing it, you agree to make an appearance. And if you don't make that appearance by your, uh, what you agreed to, there'll be a warrant issued for your arrest and the, your compulsory appearance will be had. This special appearance thing is something that the sovereign citizen movement in the 90s came up with, and uh, it's something a lot of them hang their hat on, but it really has no effect whatsoever. But anyway, by this special appearance and not submitting to the court's jurisdiction, that's what they always say, of course, hereby moves this court to strike dismiss a complaint filed by the <clears throat> for failure to present a cause of action or crime. And failure to present the court a case deprives the court of jurisdiction. Grounds are further set forth below. Now, these grounds. That is the argument that you're putting forth with support as to why this motion to dismiss should be granted. And this is what you want the judge to look at and determine uh, his decision or base his decision on. The court is further requested to provide a full finding of fact and conclusions of law if the court denies this motion. Doesn't, the court doesn't have to do that, of course. Just saying it doesn't apply is not sufficient grounds to deny this motion. Who the hell would ever say that except a sovereign citizen pseudo lawyer? I mean, who says that, that it doesn't apply is not sufficient grounds? Stevens, he's making it up as he goes along. Let's continue. Because some courts refuse to disclose the nature of the proceedings, this motion covers both civil and criminal. If deemed to be civil, the criminal parts may be ignored and vice versa. Okay, big deal, big deal. His f first ground, no case, crime, or cause of action. The foundation for the court's jurisdiction is the purpose of government itself. And it quotes, all political power is inherent in the people, and governments derive their just powers from the consent of the governed and are established to protect and maintain individual rights. And I guess he's uh, inferring that uh, most state constitutions have that in there, so uh, the victim is supposed to uh, go to his state constitution and find something like that. Uh, what's interesting, though, uh, here they are invoking the state constitution and uh, inferring that uh, it applies to them and their case, or at least, very least, they're wanting it to apply to them and their case. Uh, and that's such an inconsistency, it's unbelievable. This is why to have a case or cause of action, a plaintiff, in this case the state, must plead the violation of its own legal right. 
And he quotes, the duty of this court as of every judicial tribunal is limited to determining rights of persons and property which are actually controverted in the particular case before it. And he quotes this Tyler v. Judges of Court of Registration, but this was a civil proceeding on a dispute of a property boundary. It was not a criminal case, so that wouldn't, doesn't set, set with uh, what we're wanting. Uh, let's see, the basic elements of a case or cause of action is the violation of a legal right and loss of harm. Okay, uh, the alleged plaintiff, here you see, you know, alleged, you know, that's a dead giveaway to sovereign citizens. The alleged plaintiff state of, is a legal fiction at best. There's another indication of a sovereign citizen argument. The state is a legal fiction, it's a geographical area, and it is people. So it's uh, many different things. Uh, legal fiction at best, ostensibly acting through the cop or prosecutor, has not pled any violation of a legal right or harm. The allegation is of a violation of a statute. Duh. Legally, there's no cause of action. Now, that's just ridiculous, of course. There's no, he doesn't have any, uh, uh, well, we'll continue. Quote, he quotes, a cause of action is some particular legal right of plaintiff against defendant, together with some definite violation thereof, which occasions loss or damage. And that uh, Lucky v. McCall was a trademark case, so that's not what we're looking for. Sewall v. Martin, that was a venue challenge, and that's not what we're looking for. That doesn't have anything to do with a traffic ticket. Uh, let's continue. This includes proceedings like these allegedly criminal in nature. Qu he quotes, causation consists of two distinct sub-elements. As legal scholars have recognized, before a defendant can be convicted of a crime that includes an element of causation. Ah, see that? It's talking about a crime that includes, as an element, causation. Does traffic ticket do that? I don't know. Uh, the state must prove beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant's conduct was one, the cause in fact, and two, the legal cause, often called approximate cause <coughs> of the relevant harm. Now, this approximate cause, that's really basically a, a uh, civil uh, burden or a civil element of negligence or something like that. It uh, not really uh, applies that much to criminal, uh, certainly not to a traffic ticket, but anyway. In order to establish that a defendant's conduct was the cause, in fact, of a particular harm, the state must usually, demonst must, usually must demonstrate that but for, the sine qua non, the defendant's conduct, the harm would not have occurred. And that's Eversley v. State, and that's a manslaughter case. So, yeah, there would, <laughs> there would be some causation and cause in fact uh, in that, that case for sure. Uh, so that's not what we're looking for. And then he quotes, it is a fundamental principle of law that no person be judged guilty of a crime until the state has shown that a crime has been committed. The state, therefore, must show that a harm has been suffered of the type contemplated by the damages. Now, you get that contemplated by the damages. I mean, excuse me, contemplated by the charges. So each charge would have a different contemplation of what the harm is. Uh, for example, a death in the case of a murder charge or a loss of property in the case of a theft charge. And that such harm was incurred due to the criminal agency of another. This is sufficient if the elements of the underlying crime are proven rather than those of the particular degree or variation of that crime which may be charged. Is State v. Allen, but the, you look in to State v. Allen and it says clearly that the sole point of law that was involved in that case concerned the state's burden of proving the corpus delecti before the defendant's concession could be submitted into evidence. What they're saying is the corpus delecti rule in most states is used uh, when you have somebody that confesses to a crime but yet you have, don't have any evidence of a crime. So you can't go to court just on that confession and say, okay, we're going to try you, 
uh, judge, he made a confession, so we're going to try him. And the judge will say, well, do you have any proof that his confession is true? And if they don't, then they don't have the corpus delecti. You have to have some evidence that a crime is committed. You just can't go with a, a uh, confession. Besides, that was a death case, and uh, it's not a traffic ticket. You got to have cases that are relevant to the issue that's before the court to make it support your arguments. And so far, he's not supporting any arguments with relevant cases. Let's continue. Even if the, he goes on to say, even if the absurd claim, now that's a real smart way to talk, is made harm is not a necessary element of a real crime, the complaint is still fatally flawed as there is no accusation alleged defendant violated anyone's legal rights. Well, I don't know. It is actually alleged that the alleged defendant violated a statute of the state. Duh. That's exactly what it is. You violated a statute. And the state and the people of the state have the legal right to have their statutes enforced. Jeez. Uh, if there were a true adversary against the alleged defendant, it would be laughable. No, this motion to dismiss is laughable. It would be laughable to even try to discuss causation because the defendant is not accused of causing anything real or imagined. And I'll say again. He's in the blue here, my little side notes. Again, causation is not an element of a traffic infraction. All right, his second argument, no corpus delecti. Now this, I tell you what, sovereign citizens hang on to this corpus delecti stuff like it's a silver bullet and uh, it's going to dismiss anything that could ever happen to them when they break the law. They misinterpret a lot of it. They misapply it, and you're going to see that right here, right now. So the second argument, no corpus delecti. The corpus delecti is the body of the crime itself. Virtually every American jurisdiction agrees it's an absolutely essential element of any crime. Oh, yeah? Do they really? And it is consistent with the stated purpose of American governments. And then he quotes uh, from, I guess, a, a state uh, constitution that all political power is inherent in the people and governments derive their just powers from the consent of the governed and are established to protect and maintain individual, individual rights. So here he is again invoking a constitutional statement saying that this applies to me and my case. So here he is saying that the Constitution applies to him. Then he quotes, Corpus Delecti is usually, see that usually, not always, is usually proven by following two elements, injury or loss and someone's criminal act as cause thereof. State v. Smith. Well, here again, that was a murder case. That's not a traffic ticket, traffic infraction. So that's not relevant to our case, to our issue, to our fact circumstances. He goes on, corpus delecti consists of injury or loss in someone's criminal act which caused it. State v. Espinoza. Well, unfortunately, that is not so with strict liability offenses like a traffic infraction, as well as other cases which uh, we'll, we shall see. In every criminal trial, the prosecution must prove the corpus delecti or the body of the crime itself. Jesus Christ, this guy repeats himself over and over. How many, how many times is he going to cover corpus electi? Let's continue. Uh, or the body of the crime itself. For example, the fact of injury, loss, or harm, and the existence of a criminal agency as its cause. Well, the thing about it is, in California, uh, has traditionally been held the prosecution cannot satisfy this burden by relying exclusively upon the extrajudicial statements, confessions, or admissions of the defendant. And we're back to that again, that, that many of the states look at corpus delecti as just something you look at when you have a confession. So you've got a confession, it's all written out and signed and everything, but do you have a crime that you can prove? Can you prove that, a crime, that this confession even links itself to a crime? So that's the way corpus delecti is mostly looked at, and we will get into that even further. 
The term corpus delecti embraces, oh, oh, embraces, occurrence of loss or injury and criminal causation thereof. But what Stevens doesn't bring out in that, what is also said in that case, is however, it is firmly established in this state that the term corpus delecti embraces only the first two of these elements, loss or injury and criminal causation. State v. Hill. The thing about that is another murder case. What is it with Stevens and these murder cases? <clears throat> Let's talk about some traffic stuff or something like that, that type of case instead of a murder case. Uh, then he quotes, the corpus delecti of a crime consists of two elements. One, the fact of the injury or loss or harm, and two, the existence of a criminal agency as its cause. Citations omitted. There must be sufficient proof of both elements of the corpus delecti beyond a reasonable doubt. And that's a quote from Amer Amjur, American Jurisprudence, which is an encyclopedia. It's not law, and it's, it's out of place here. But that's what, uh, that's what Internet sovereign citizens, pseudo lawyers do. They just throw shit on the wall to see what sticks. Uh, this is not the same as the corpus delecti rule, which is not an element of the alleged crime, but a procedural rule. There is no corpus delecti pled in the complaint. Without a corpus delecti, there is no crime. And he quotes another case. Component parts of every crime are the occurrence of a specific kind of injury or loss, somebody's criminality as the source of the loss, and the accused identity as the doer of the crime. The first two elements are what constitutes the concept of corpus delecti. Now, but what he did not quote in that case, as you go along, here's what they say. It's really interesting. Quote, the corpus delecti issue is not relevant to this case because we conclude that the concept of corpus delecti has no practical application to the crime of which the defendant was convicted. Now, boom, He's, uh, he quotes this case as supporting his position, but the judges say it doesn't support his position and doesn't even apply. And this was a case about the possession of a firearm by a felon. And like a traffic infraction, there was no injury, loss, or harm done. So you get that? There was no loss or harm, but it's still a crime. And the corpus delecti, it does not need a corpus delecti. This is what's called a strict liability crime or infraction. See, Stevens doesn't know this stuff. Okay. His third argument, lack of jurisdiction. Standing represents a jurisdictional requirement which remains open to review at all stages of the litigation. And he quotes now National Organization for Women v. Scheidler. Well, that was a civil case. And standing is only uh, recognized and part of civil procedure, not criminal procedure. Uh, courts, if nothing else, take judicial notice that uh, the state... Uh, has standing to enforce their laws. <clears throat> and he, he goes on. Because there is no corpus delecti, there is no crime. How many times is he going to say that? I have no idea. Uh, yes, there is a so-called crime alleged on paper, but the allegation feeds, fails to meet every legal standard of what a crime is. Well, we've just seen that the corp, corpus delecti is not needed in this kind of, uh, is not uh, applicable to this kind of case. So everything we're going to read from this point on, we, we know, is uh, bullshit. Uh, also, because American governments are established for the sole purpose of protecting rights, a true crime requires the violation of a legal right. Oh, God. Alleged defendant is not accused of violating anyone's legal rights, except all the people of the state. <laughs> Therefore, there is no crime, case, or cause of action pled, and the court has no jurisdiction. 
Oh, wrong. Oh, God. The complaint, his fourth argument, the complaint is unfit for adjudication. Because American courts are adversary systems, the complaint is, quote, unfit for adjudication, end quote. The Supreme Court, oh, he's quoting the Supreme Court here. The Supreme Court has found unfit for adjudication any cause that is not in any real sense adversary. And that does not assume the honest and actual antagonistic assertions of rights to be adjudicated. And uh, he leaves out this part. The appeals are dismissed because the records in these cases do not present controversies justifying the adjudication of a constitutional issue. So this was a case about a contraception advice and, the 14th, and it was a 14th Amendment challenge. It was not a criminal case. And this is uh, Poe v. Ullman. Now, I, I want to do a, want to go to one thing real quick on this, uh, this U.S. v. Shunk that, that uh, Stevens quoted. He left out so much of that case uh, regarding corpus delecti. I want to get you guys uh, to go, uh, go over some of that with you all. So you can see where they're, uh, what he has left out and why he's left it out, it will probably become very apparent. So here's what uh, sh the Shrunk case says. It says, Curley ar next argues that the district court should have instructed the jury not to convict him merely on the admissions contained in his letters to the director, yada, yada. Uh, which Kersey appeals to the rule that requires proof of the corpus delecti of the crime, which to say proof, apart from the defendant's concessions or admissions that a crime actually occurred. And the uh, requirement that the prosecution demonstrate the existence of the corpus delecti of a crime is a, quote, a vestige of time when brutal methods were commonly used to extract confessions, sometimes to crimes that had not been committed. Its purpose was to prevent the conviction of an individual based on the basis of an unrealizable, unreliable confession. And it goes through here and it talks about, uh, it, it quotes uh, Fordham Law Review and different things, but the, the really the bottom line that you need to come away from is a traffic ticket, a traffic infraction. These, uh, you know, crimes where there is no harm and no injury or no loss are real, and the courts, here's what the courts look at it. We do not, however, recognize that the corpus delecti concept is not relevant to a crime such as the present one where there is no tangible injury or loss, and the crime cannot be found committed without reference to a specific defendant. So, in other words, you can find a dead body, and you can look at it, and if it has a gunshot to the back of the head, you can figure out there was a murder. So you've got the makings of a crime. You've got part of the corpus electi there. And it doesn't look like it was an accident, so uh, it could have been. But you, you, uh, if you, have, you don't have any particular person to pin it on. You can, so in other words, you can have a murder and not have a, uh, you know, a perpetrator yet. Or maybe ever if you can't find one. But you can't have a speeding infraction and not have a person <laughs> at the very time that it's happening. So that's basically what that means there. Okay, let me move back up here. If I didn't lose it here. Where were we? It's the first time I'm using... Uh, this OSB. I hope uh, you like it a little bit better. Okay. Uh, even if the phrase corpus delecti is not used, there is no doubt this is not an adversary proceeding as there are no allegations I violated any legal rights. Well, here again, this is not relative to a strict liability case such as a traffic infraction. And it is an adversary proceeding because the state is your adversary. You're the defendant, they're the plaintiff, they say you did something, you either say I did it or I didn't. That's the adversarial positions. That's, one of, that's a really ridiculous statement there made. 
Uh, now, it's five is another real uh, sovereign citizen argument he puts in here. And it goes, no evidence of presence within the state and law is applicable. There are no facts pled to prove my presence within the plaintiff state and that the laws are applicable to me. Now, that's got to be the, the most stupid statement anybody could ever say because you're standing right in front of the judge talking about a motion to dismiss and you're saying you're not within, the judge says you're not within the boundaries of the state. You know, this is just wordsmithing bullshit. Anyway, such evidence is essential to prove jurisdiction, but he doesn't uh, cite any supporting uh, evidence there. He goes on, mere geographic location is not evidence of presence within this alleged plaintiff, the state. It's impossible to prove my presence within the alleged plaintiff beyond a reasonable doubt or preponderance of the evidence. The state, while obviously not geographic, is at its best political as it did not exist prior to November 11th, 1889, or whatever your state you're in, whatever that date would be. And This is just stupid, people. I mean, it is just stupid. At the very best, I guess, it's a political question. At the worst, it's just insanity. He goes on. The phrase state of so-and-so appears to be not much more than a doing business as or pseudonym for lawyers and police officers. That's pretty stupid. This will be shown if a state lawyer responds to this motion. And here again, no supporting authoritative citations uh, to back up that statement. He goes on, as the laws of the state only apply within the state, there is no evidence and nothing alleged that the law of the state apply to me. Well, now he's talking about within the state. He admits that the, the laws of the state apply within the state. Okay, so we know that it's, you can be within the state. I mean, Jesus. Anyway, application of the law is not alleged on a traffic ticket or in the complaint. It is not an element of a crime. Let Stevens prove that it is. Let's see some t citations, something that says that uh, applicability of the law is an element of a crime. If this is a criminal proceeding, then the assigned judge is obligated to presume my innocent until it is proven beyond a reasonable doubt. Now what? He's to presume your innocence until it's proven beyond a reasonable doubt? That makes no sense. You know, you should have proofread this, Stevens. That's the dumbest statement you've made so far, I think. I think you're supposed to, I think you're supposed to say until it's proven not to be true beyond a reasonable doubt. But anyway, the judge may not assume the law is applicable now. Who says? You? Because it is an essential element of the alleged crime. Well, Stevens, the judge can take judicial notice of a legislative fact and that legislative fact being that they wrote a law and said to whom it applies and how it's to be enforced. And there are no supporting authoritative citations which say that applicability of the law is an essential element of a crime. Produce that evidence, Stevens. Give me a quotation. Give me a, give me a citation. Not a quotation. You'll take it out of context. Give me a, give me a citation where it says that an essential element of a crime is applicability of the law. And let me tell you one thing, Stevens. Statements made to you in phone calls or pretrial conferences or other conferences are not relevant. They're not evidence. They are not sworn testimony. Got it? The sixth argument. The court's jurisdiction not enlarged by police authority. The jurisdiction of the court is limited to protecting rights. This is not enlarged by alleging the police have authority to issue tickets and to arrest people. Such authority does not work to trump fundamental limitations on the courts. 
the hell does that mean? I mean, the police are part of the uh, executive branch. Uh, what the hell is he talking about? Anyway, who knows with a sovereign citizen. He goes on. No amount of police authority may enlarge the limits of the adversary system. Adversary systems require true adversaries. Well, that's what you got in the traffic ticket, Stevens. This requires the allegation and proof of loss of injury. No, not on a traffic ticket. All that's required is uh, the allegation that uh, there's a law and you broke the law. The plaintiffs have failed to make such allegations. No, they have not. Yes, police may have authority to issue traffic tickets and to stop and prevent crime. They must still allege injury for the court to proceed with jurisdiction. Who says? You, Stevens? Here again, no supporting authoritative citations. You just make it up and you think it's good. Now remember, a judge is reading this just like I am. And he's probably thinking about it just like I am. So remember that. So here's his conclusion. Because the plaintiff, the state, has failed to allege the required elements of a cause of action, crime, and there is no corpus delecti, the court has jurisdiction. Well, we've just blown that totally out of the water. And the judge who's been reading this comes to the same conclusion. None of this is applicable, and most of it is without merit. The, as, and as such, the court should enter, strike the complaint filed, ale, filed against alleged defendant, or dismiss it. So now, here we have it. Just like, a, just like we've gone through here, a judge who knows a hell of a lot about law, knows the law, knows what his job is, knows how to apply the law, knows how to interpret the law and all that. He's reading this just like we did. And he's seeing it the same way I'm seeing it. Any legal professional would see it the same way. So we've just read a whole motion to dismiss that there's no way in hell a judge would ever grant that motion to dismiss on these bullshit grounds and arguments that Stevens has put forth. It'll never happen. Now Stevens says it's happened and uh, we'll be going to that with his evidence here in just a minute. So then you got your certificate of service, you mail it to him. This, this all comes in his Stevens little packet that he has. And here's, the, uh, here's what a proposed order looks like. As you see, Here's what an order looks like. In other words, if his motion to dismiss is granted, here's what it will look like. Because this is what you do is when you submit a motion to dismiss, you put in this uh, proposed order so all the judge has to do is sign it. And this comes in the packet that Stephen sells. And the order can be broken down in about three places here. The first sentence is the introduction of what it's doing. The second sentence is what the court is basing uh, the decision on, what they've uh, reviewed that they're going to make the decision on. And the last uh, sentence is the decision they made. And you can see the middle sentence here that Stephen types out is the court being fully advised of the premises. In other words, the court having totally read all of your arguments and having looked at them real hard and, they, and I, you have good cause to, to uh, uh, present them. Uh, and that's what we're looking at. And we, uh, we buy into it. It looks good. Uh, it is therefore hereby ordered granting the defendant's motion to dismiss with prejudice. So there you have it. That's what, if Stevens' motions to dismiss has been granted, it would have to be on a form that looks just like this if it was granted on the grounds, on the arguments that he made in that motion to dismiss. Okay, this is what it would look like. Now let's see what it looks like that Stephen uh, puts forth as evidence of his uh, motion to dismiss being granted. This is one. Now look at this. There, there he says that's proof that... Uh, his 
Motion to dismiss was granted. Does that look like anything like an order from a judge? I mean, hell, anybody could have scribbled this shit down here. Anybody could have scribbled that. But this is this is evidence to Stevens that his motion works. That's, that's, that's just really, I can't believe people buy into that. Here's another one that he puts forward, said, say my motion to dismiss was granted. Well, it was, but on what grounds? Let's look. As you can see, here's the first sentence. It's telling you what they're doing, what, what they've, uh, the purpose of what, what they're looking at. The middle sentence is what the judge looked at and made his decision upon. And the, the last one is his decision. So he made his decision on that the state's reply is conclusory, conclusory and contains no analysis, no citation to authority, nor any application of the facts to the law or an explanation why such an application is unnecessary for the court. That's the reason the court is going to grant the motion to dismiss. Not all the arguments that Stevens laid out, but that reason right there is the state failed to respond to the motion. And you can see that because it says, therefore, it says this, therefore, because of this, the court uh, dismisses the case. So that's not evidence. See, it's not evidence that his motion and are the arguments within his motion were the reason it was dismissed. Now, is it? Now, this one is one that you'll see uses his proposed order, right, just like, the other, just like the one we showed you, this matter coming before the court on defendant's motion to dismiss, the court being fully, full advised of the premises and good cause appearing, it grants the motion to dismiss. And I mean, Steve, this was after a trial, and Stevens just ballyhooed this and said, here it is, yada, yada, yada. My motion to dismiss, even after trial, was uh, granted, and uh, the case was dismissed, and I'm a hero. Well, this is the only evidence that he has that his motion to dismiss was granted on the arguments within that motion to dismiss. It's the only one he's got. Problem is, it was a mistake. And here is the order clarifying that order as being a mistake. What the judge thought he was signing was dismissing the appeal. He thought the defendant was changed the mind on the appeal and was dis wanted to dismiss her appeal, and he signed it. And uh, before they entered it into the books, they noticed the, the error, and it's right here. You can see, wherefore, the reason set forth above, the court hereby orders that the order from January 11th is hereby declared null and void. So the only time that Stevens' motion to dismiss was granted on the grounds and his arguments that he made was a mistake. So bottom line is Stevens still has no evidence that his motion to dismiss has ever been granted based on the arguments made within it. So there you have it. Now, I, I do say, I will say this, that um, that case I just talked about, she did go ahead and appeal. And I, that appeal has been decided. And I do have that appeal, and I will be making a video of that appeal and uh, explaining and going through it just like I did this. So there you have it. There's that wonderful, magical motion to dismiss. And I hope you enjoyed the, uh, the analysis of it. I wanted to make a quick addendum here. I think I misspoke. But um, looking at that motion to dismiss, of course, you could see corpus delecti was a big deal with Stevens. And most sovereign citizens, they all uh, question the judge about where's the corpus delecti? Who's the victim? So anyway, I want to uh, reiterate this on the case that uh, Stevens quotes, this uh, U.S. v. Shrunk, and that is that uh, 
a crime like a uh, traffic infraction falls within this, and the court says, we do, however, recognize that the corpus delecti concept is not relevant to a crime such as the present one where there is no tangible injury or loss. So there you go. There are crimes where there is no tangible injury or loss and the corpus delecti is not relevant. So most of, that's what a judge sees in that uh, motion to dismiss of Stevens is a lot of irrelevant uh, issues or statements that are without merit.